Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. We're in Ephesians chapter 6 and we're finishing our series and I'm going to try to get through it. (laughs) Ephesians chapter 6, we have been learning about how to be a stronger church And we come to the close of this beautiful letter that God inspired and spoke and inspired to through the Holy Spirit for Paul to write. And, you know, we've learned last week about the armor of God and that we are clothed in the armor of God because we're clothed in Christ. That when you put your faith in Christ, you have his truth, his righteousness his peace, his faith, the sword of the spirit. You have all of these things that are clothing you and protecting you, helping you stand firm and strong in the fight. And Paul then talks about the power and the purpose of prayer in that fight. And so I thank God that we spent time praying and worshiping already. And Paul is, Paul does not, separate warfare or reaching the lost from prayer. Paul keeps it all together. And so that's where we're at today. And here's where we are. Ephesians chapter six, verse 18. He says, pray in the spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. And pray for me too. Ask God to give me the right word so I can boldly explain God's mysterious plan that the good news is for Jews and Gentiles alike. I am in chains now, still preaching this message as God's ambassador. So pray that I will keep on speaking boldly for him as I should. To bring you up to date, Tychicus will give you a full report about what I am doing and how I am getting along. He is a beloved brother and faithful helper in the Lord's work. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, to let you know how we are doing and to encourage you. And then he ends just the way he started his letter, a prayer. Peace be with you, dear brothers and sisters. And may God, the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ give you love with faithfulness. May God's grace be eternally upon all who love our Lord, Jesus Christ. And the church says, amen. When the enemy attacks, Paul's saying we must pray. Prayer isn't just a weapon. Prayer is part of the conflict itself in the battle. And I read one theologian that said, to to not pray is to surrender to the enemy. And it's true. We have the ability to pray. And when we pray, we're asking God to be included in the conflict. When we don't pray, it's as if we are there by ourselves, not asking God to help. I don't know about you, but I don't want to go through anything in this world without God's help. And so praying is key, but prayer in the spirit, Paul goes to. He doesn't just say pray. He's saying pray in the spirit. What does that mean? You know, a feeble, powerless prayer life and occasional grocery list prayers are not effective in spiritual warfare. We must seek the help of the Holy Spirit. Ask him to lead us as we pray in personal to congregational settings or intercession. And Paul tells us to pray in the Spirit because we can't do this on our own. We need his help and power, especially in spiritual battles. Paul is suggesting that don't just pray, but pray in the Spirit. Have the Spirit with you, helping you pray. This is the same thing that Jude says, Jesus' half-brother. This is a book you maybe have never turned to in the Bible. Jude, right before Revelation. And there's no chapter number because there's only one chapter. 
So we're going to be in verse 17 of Jude, right before Revelation. It's not a book really mentioned too much or preached about, but a powerful book. And Jude is warning the church of false teachers, and he's encouraging them here to remain faithful. And in verse 17, he says, But you, my dear friends, must remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ said. So he'd be talking about the apostle Paul. And he said, they told you that in the last times there would be scoffers whose purpose in life is to satisfy their ungodly desires. These people are the ones who are creating divisions among you. They follow their natural instincts because they do not have God's spirit in them. But you, dear brothers, must, or dear friends, must build each other up in your most holy faith. Pray in the power of the Holy Spirit. So don't just pray, don't just have a grocery list, prayer list, you know, maybe, you know, hey, we're all human, I've been there. You're praying and all of a sudden, (laughs) not half-hearted prayers, but a prayer that says, Holy Spirit, help me pray right now for this situation. A prayer that invites the power of the Holy Spirit to move and work. He's saying pray like that because the battle is fierce against false teachers and for the sacredity of the church. And await the mercy, this is what it says in verse 21, await the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ who will bring you eternal life. In this way, you will keep yourself safe in God's love. And then talk about warfare for one another in the church. Verse 22, and you must show mercy to those whose faith is wavering or doubt in the NIV. Did we hear a word from the Lord today about do not doubt? We did. If a brother or sister in Christ is doubting, let's help them. Let's show mercy. Let's not make them feel bad for it. Everyone goes through doubts. Let's show mercy to them. And then verse 23, rescue others by snatching them from the flames of judgment. Wow, snatching them, pulling them from the fire. Show mercy to others, but do so with great caution, hating the sins that contaminate their lives. Go reach the lost, but do not join in their activities. Sounds like a fight to me from what we learned last week. Spiritual warfare, that it's not going to be easy. So we better go empowered by the Holy Spirit. And Paul says the same thing in his letter, just as Jude says as well. I love what, uh, I love what David, P.H. David says about what does it mean to be praying in the Spirit. Praying in the Spirit is in line with the usual sense of doing something in the Spirit. So prophecy produced by the Spirit. Travel directed by the Spirit. You can actually read about that in Acts 19. Joy produced by the Spirit. Did you know that when you have a a moment of joy, maybe in church or when you're hanging out with God or with another believer, the Spirit of God is giving you that joy. How cool is that? Uh, Here we go. Speech controlled by the Spirit. Using our gifts. Speaking in unknown languages and interpretation of them. um, Using God's word. And being prophets and and prophesying his word, as we can read about in 1 Corinthians 12, using our spiritual gifts. Even when we studied Ephesians 5, 18, controlled by the spirit versus alcohol. So all this means it refers to prayer controlled or guided by the Holy Spirit. So in other words, you have the spirit of God to help you pray. That's mentioned in Romans chapter 8, 26 through 27. That when you don't know what to pray, the Holy Spirit will pray for you and through you and help you pray. There are going to be times in your family, in your life, where you, well, for me, after reading this this week, you know what I realized? I want to go to the Holy Spirit right away every single time. I want to pray that way every single time. This was so convicting to study this this week. And I've been thinking about for the past three weeks because I look ahead. And and even a a few weeks ago when I was studying this and looking at it, God was like, take time to pray in my spirit, not just a quick grocery list. And that's the the way I want to pray. That's what I'm going to grow in. 
He even talks about prayer in tongues. You can read a lot about praying in the spirit or tongues in 1 Corinthians 4, uh, 14. Paul talks about it, how it's used in the church in 1 Corinthians 12 through 14. But some people will get a word from the Lord in tongues for the whole church, and there'll be an interpretation. But did you know that you can also have a private prayer life of praying in the spirit? And you can pray in tongues in your private life where there isn't a word for someone else. It's just to edify you as a person. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you pray and you will pray. You don't have to make it up. You don't have to fake it. The Holy Spirit will help you pray in the Spirit. It will be authentic prayer filled with the Holy Spirit. What else does he say here about prayer in our scripture today? He says, pray at all times and on every occasion. And this is suggesting the thoroughness and intensity of our prayers. And I got to tell you, church, there's always unfinished work and ground to cover that needs to be soaked in spirit-led, spirit-empowered prayer. There's always something that needs to be done, someone to pray for. The work of God is not finished. Your neighborhood needs Jesus. Delaware needs to be saved. America needs to be saved. Our world needs Jesus. There's plenty to pray for. You know, one thing that's helped my prayer life is to recognize that the world, first of all, is not saved, and also that we're always in a spiritual battle. When you look at life through eternal perspective, it changes the urgency in the amount of times and how much you pray. And we're called to have eternal perspective on this world, not just a physical. In other words, see life through the eternal, eternal eyes, not through the physical eyes. Eyes of faith. And your family, your friends, this church needs prayer. And when you realize that you're a soldier for Christ on the front lines, it would change your prayer life. All of a sudden, your prayer list is longer and bigger, and you're pray, praying more fervently and harder for those around you. Start reaching your neighbors and watch your prayer life change. Don't forget and don't give up on family members that don't know Jesus and watch your prayer life change. Try to share the gospel when you're out in the community, and you'll start praying in your car on your way home after hanging out with that person. When we realize we're on mission and that we're trying to help people find the truth of Jesus Christ, it changes our prayer life. Paul is saying pray at all times and on every occasion because they were constantly needing to pray. He's talking to a church, a young church, the Ephesus church, that was living in a very godless, unholy city. And so the importance of praying constantly was on his mind. He says, when he, in the scripture we have today, he says, stay alert. Stay alert. Like reliable soldiers, stay awake, stay alert. Remember when the disciples were praying in the garden with Jesus and they fell asleep? He's saying, don't be like that. Stay alert. Stay awake and pray at all times. I mean, do you have to sleep? Yes. Yes, of course, we have to sleep. And should we pray with our eyes closed driving? I've told you that. No. That would be irresponsible prayer life. Prayer and staying alert are spiritual postures for battle. The same Greek words used in standing firm or standing strong in the verses before our verses today, talking about the armor, there's the same Greek grammar used here. In other words, stand by. What's, what's the posture for us spiritually in war, it's to stand by and pray. When I thought about that, I was like, that is cool. How do I stay alert? How do I stay in, uh, stand firm physically and spiritually? Well, it's through prayer. Spiritually being ready to pray at all times, in all situations. To stay alert means to keep your eyes, your spiritual eyes open and go, there could be a spiritual fight right in front of me. My family's going through something. It could be a spiritual battle going on right now. Let me stay alert and pray. You know, your physical posture of prayer is, is not the big deal to God. 
You know, if you want to walk around and pray, if you want to lay down on the ground with your, with your face to the ground, if you want to get on your knees, those are all amazing ways to pray. You could, uh, I like to go for walks. I'll stand still sometimes with my arms open to God. The physical posture is not the big important thing to God. It's your heart. He just wants you to pray from your heart. But I tell you, that sometimes I'm pacing because I'm fighting and I'm interceding for someone. So the physical posture is secondary. The spiritual posture is staying alert and leaning and trusting in God to help you pray. So stay alert. He goes on to say this, pray persistently for all believers everywhere. We must not reserve our prayers for scheduled prayer meetings or church services. No, Paul urges persistent, unceasing prayers. In other words, may we not wait till we come here on a Sunday to pray. Let it be that God knows us by name, first of all, because he knows all things. But may he see the top of our head all the time. Oh, is, that, is that Ryan again coming to me to pray? Do you remember the persistent widow that kept going to the judge? That story. Be like her, constantly coming to the judge, constantly coming to God. Let's be unceasing and persistent for our needs. And let us never assume any believer is strong enough and doesn't need our prayers. Did you hear that? Because he says, pray for all believers everywhere. So this, your prayer life is not meant just to be praying about yourself. We need to pray for each other. We, will make, we are making a mistake and we will make mistakes if we think that your fellow brother or sister in Christ doesn't need prayer. Man, they can quote scripture left and right. They got their hands up in the air worshiping God on Sundays. They lead Bible studies. Hear me out. Prayer warriors need prayer because we're human. And the devil is coming at God's warriors. He's coming at us. So let us make sure that in our prayer lives, whenever you do that, in the morning, in the afternoon, at night, all day, would you please be open and please keep in consideration this church and your, the people sitting right next to you. Pray for them. It's so key. Paul goes on to say this. Pray for me. Pray for me. And what's interesting is, is Paul's in prison. And he does not ask the church to pray for his freedom and release. He doesn't have, uh, uh, doesn't pout or have a pity party. He has come to accept that being in change is part of God's plan. This entire letter has been written while he's in Rome or while he's in, in prison under Rome's power. He's writing this letter and he doesn't ask for freedom or release. I just want it to be known that if I'm ever persecuted as a pastor for preaching the gospel, you can go ahead and pray for my release, all right? <laughs> or pray for God's will to be done. Because I guarantee you there is a prison guard in our prisons here that need Jesus. I guarantee you there's a prisoner that doesn't know Christ. And God will send you places you do not want to go because the spiritual life, the work of the spirit has different plans than the work of the flesh in our lives here in America. God wants to save souls. See, God doesn't see just this physical life. He sees what's next. He knows what's coming. He sees how many people are going to hell, how many people are going to heaven. He's not too worried about Paul's comfort. He's concerned about those who are going to hell without Christ. Paul also isn't really worried about his comfort either. This is what he says in Acts 20, 22 through 24. And now I am bound or compelled by the spirit to, to go to Jerusalem. I don't know what awaits me except that the Holy Spirit tells me in city after city that jail and suffering lie ahead. Now, wait a second. I thought that when you believe in Jesus Christ, all your problems go away. <sighs> You're running through fields and butterflies are flying up. Your bank account is never empty. Your job, oh, everyone loves you. You keep getting promotions. 
Everything is perfect when you are a Christian. Wrong. In fact, it can get harder because you've allied yourself with God and the devil doesn't like the victory you have in Jesus Christ. And God knows that this life is only temporary and eternity is true, real life. And we're going to be there soon. And everything on this earth will pass away, but his word never does. He's in heaven. He is in eternity preparing a place for you and I because he knows this is only just a blip of time and a snap of a finger. It's insane, isn't it? And yet we'll pour so much worry. We'll put so much uh, focus on this life. And yet everything is going to come to an end when Christ comes back. What was the purpose? What was the purpose of Paul's life? My life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus. Jesus gave him this task, the work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. You know what that means for Paul? His task does not end just because he's in prison. In fact, he's there because God is wanting to use him there. I want to encourage you, church, if you're going through something, open your spiritual eyes and your faith and think about maybe God is trying to use you in that situation. Maybe God is trying to prepare you for something coming. I've heard a lot of people say, I am struggling through life. Well, maybe the comforter is going to comfort you so you can comfort others. Amen? He's preparing you. God doesn't waste our trials and suffering. He uses it for his glory. We just have to see it that way. And Paul doesn't say, get me out of here. Can you imagine being an ambassador who loves to travel and speak and teach and preach, being stuck in a house for two years? I was in quarantine for like three months. I couldn't stand it. Can you imagine that? To, to stop an ambassador from traveling is to, like, is to have no wheels on a car. You're, you're not going anywhere. And Paul would not be muzzled. He would not be stopped. His prayer was that, the, he, here's what he said, church, pray that God would give me the right words to say. To preach boldly about the mysterious gospel that Christ came to save Jews and Gentiles, so all people. Why is that important? Because Rome is watching him and chained to him right now. Roman soldiers are chained to him, and he wants to tell them about Jesus, even though they're Gentiles. They weren't, they weren't a Jew. And so he wants to save anyone that would be willing to believe. Praise God for that. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll say this too. Um, he, he asked for prayer. I want to ask for prayer. I want you to know that uh, I need your prayers. I need your prayers. Because just about every week, the devil will try to make me be afraid to preach. It does, probably doesn't look like it, does it? The devil will use doubt against preachers. They'll spend 20 hours a week praying and, and, and writing sermons. And then one minute before going up or 30 minutes before going up to preach, doubt that your word's going to work or the word that, that you have is even going to matter to people. That's how the devil works. Would you please pray for me every Sunday that God would just, just completely protect me from the enemy and his flaming arrows that he shoots so far away and hits us with. And that goes for all of us, right? Let's pray for each other. The devil doesn't want you to come to church. You see what happened today in this room so far? You think the devil wants you to be here? No. Let's pray, and let's pray every day for each other. Amen? Our prayer list just got huge, didn't it? <laughs> I appreciate your prayer. Well, he, he transitions to this random paragraph about Tychicus um, bringing... Uh, this letter, he's going to be the deliverer of this, um, and he's going to encourage the church. Isn't that cool? Paul is suffering in prison, and he says, let me encourage the church. Wow. And I thought about that this week, and I said, the task of sharing the gospel belongs to the whole church, not just Paul. Not just Pastor Ryan. We need you. 
I value you. You're so important. Not everyone is up here on stage. Great, because that would be a really long Sunday of everyone preaching. You're called to preach if you're driving Uber, if you're in the office, if you're at a park, if you're at a game, you can show the love of Christ and tell people about Jesus Christ. You are deliverers of the gospel of Jesus with me. Together we do this. In fact, we are weak if we don't do it together. And Paul leaned in hard on his helpers. And he was so blessed to have them because he was chained to a soldier and couldn't go anywhere. So he used the body of Christ. We are all valuable to God. We all bring something to this family to be used to help people know Jesus. I want to encourage you to step out in faith and show the world Jesus Christ. Reaching the world with the good news of Jesus was never one person's task. It belongs to the whole church. From the pulpit to the pew, we can do it. From the pulpit to the pew. Paul's final greeting and encouragement. He talks about having peace over their life. He talks about love and faithfulness to God, and he ends by saying, have everlasting, the everlasting grace of God to be on all those who love him. What a beautiful prayer. A prayer prayed from experience. In chains, once again, remember that. And he's praying for the peace, love, faithfulness, and grace of God, the favor of God, to be on the church. It's beautiful. Beautiful. So let me wrap up with how we can be prayer warriors. Prayer is highly valued to prayer warriors. Let's value prayer. We cannot live in this world without the help of God. We cannot face the spiritual battles we're going to come across without the help of God. Prayer is a weapon for war. To not pray is to surrender to the enemy. And we have already won the victory. So that doesn't even make sense sometimes, does it? But he is going to try to get you back because you've won the victory in Christ already through faith. He's trying to sabotage your victory. He's trying to ruin your day. Make your day so bad. Make you doubt what Christ has done for you that you never tell anyone about Jesus. Because we're so caught up in what didn't happen or what we're going through. It's so slick. It's so, it's so devious of him. We must pray because we're in a fight. Prayer is a daily priority. It needs to be our priority in our lives. We can't grow our prayer life until we start it. Amen? Find a place to pray every day. Grab a notepad. Begin to write your prayers down. I heard one writer say that he would write on one column or one side of the, of the journal his prayers, and he would leave the right page open so he could see all the prayers that were answered and write them in. Oh, that was a cool idea. Create a prayer list and pray fervently and vigorously through them. Pray in the power of the Spirit. Are you struggling to pray? Ask the Spirit to pray with you. Ask the Spirit to pray through you. Lean in on the power of the Holy Spirit. Pray and intercede for all believers. We're not in this alone. We're in this together. This is not a solo journey. This is a community. Let's pray for one another. And then you ready? This is a tough one. Because some of us don't feel adequate enough to share Jesus. And I'm saying, let's just pray boldly with faith for opportunities and courage to share the gospel. In other words, let's not pray, God, I, I pray that you will um, help me to do that, which we need his help. What I'm saying is, God, I want to do it. Give me the opportunity. Give me the courage to do it. See that subtle shift? Pray with boldness. Paul said, pray that I have the boldness. Pray that you have the boldness. That when the opportunity comes, because it's going to, no matter who it is in your life, that you will seize that opportunity. And that you will share the good news of Jesus from your own life. So church, we learned a lot through this book, didn't we? We're stronger because of who God is. We're stronger because 
God has saved us. And we need to be stronger in this world that we're living in. The church is stronger and in unity because Christ has brought us together. Chapter 4, he was talking about being so loving and caring to one another, to be honest to each other. Let's be strong like that. Chapter 5, he was talking about being a light in our world and being different than our world and being stronger for God in this world. We learned in chapter 5 and chapter 6 to have strong marriages, strong families, to be a strong light at work. And then we learned that we can be strong in the Lord because of the armor of God that's on our lives. In church, we're stronger when we pray. Let us not be weak. Let us be stronger. And the way we are stronger as a church is when we pray. Amen. What a powerful series, huh? It's been an awesome journey to go through the book of Ephesians. And to kind of really bring this all together, we want to take communion together. So you can prepare your cups. Because what's beautiful about this letter is a lot of people call Ephesians, they subtitle it, In Christ. Because the first chapter talks about being in Christ so much. And we're in his armor. (laughs) We're in his inheritance. We're in God's will. Praise God. We're in his prayers. Well, we're one body together in fellowship. So we want to take this communion together. The bread represents the body of Christ that was broken for our sins. Jesus had to be the sacrifice. There was no greater sacrifice. Nothing that could take away the sins of the world except for Jesus. So the bread represents his body pierced for our transgressions. The juice represents his blood poured out for us for the forgiveness, the justification, the salvation of our sins. We take these together because Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Don't forget. But he also says something else. I'm coming back. And the next time we do this in his presence, physically, eye to eye, face to face, is when he comes back for his church. So he says, take this as well to remember that coming. May we never forget the future life that is to come. Amen. God, we thank you for this bread. We remember what you did for us. We sang about it today. You're an awesome God. You're our living hope. What's beautiful, God, is your son Jesus rose again to give us life through his sacrifice. So we take this bread and this juice to remember what you've done for us. Amen. Let's take it together. pray a prayer over us, and then Pastor Brian will come up to share a few things. Thank you, God. You spoke already so much today, and we're challenged today to have a strong prayer life. We're challenged to lean in on you going through battles, to talk to you about them, to seek your help, but also to pray in the power of the Holy Spirit and to pray for others, to pray that the gospel will go out boldly to our community. God, we want Delaware saved by Jesus Christ. We want our nation saved. We want our world to know Christ and be saved. God, we pray the blood of Christ over this state, including our homes, 
our communities, Lord, our, our workplaces, our country, and our world. God, use us. May we have the eyes to see the opportunities and may we boldly seize them, God. May we not be afraid. I know, God, for many of us, it may be new, it may be scary to share what you've done for us, but I pray, God, that you give us the boldness and the courage to do it. So many people are hungry for you. May we not be discouraged by all the skeptics. God, may we lean in on your promise that your word does not return void, that we can cast out the seeds of Christ and it will take root in lives. God, we pray for fertile ground that when we share Jesus, Lord, that people will believe and receive. God, I pray you would strengthen my brothers and sisters in Christ. Give us endurance to live in this world right now. It is not easy. It seems like the world is coming against us. God, I pray you would strengthen us. And Lord, in the midst of the battle, we still have joy and peace. And that's amazing. It, it surpasses all understanding, as your word says. God, give us peace and joy in the midst of the battle in our lives. And Lord, I pray that our prayers would avail much. They would accomplish much. God, that when we pray, there would be fruit from our prayers, that your spirit would work through them powerfully. And God, when we don't know what to pray or what to say, I pray your Holy Spirit would pray for us, pray through us. God, you see the burdens in this room today. You see the people that we're concerned for. You see our, even our own burdens and concerns and worries. God, we cast all our cares and anxieties upon you and give you thanks for your faithfulness. We give you thanks for being awesome and faithful in every circumstance. We stand in Christ. We stand on Christ, the cornerstone. Nothing can shake us. It may not be easy to stand, but we together can hold each other up and the power and the joy of the Lord will give us strength. We thank you for your faithfulness and your promises and your word. And once again, for speaking and encouraging us today. Thank you, God, that today people are set free and will, and will walk out of this room free, free indeed. May they continue to walk that way. We love you, God, and we thank you for what you've done. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you, church. Have a good day.